you want to get different results, better results, you have to do something different. Five years ago, this campus was graduating 25%. That's one in every four child. Now we're up to uh, two years consistently close to 85, 84 point something, 85%. Having our students live in the poorest congressional district in the United States, uh, we have to do everything in our power to try to get them to be good citizens and, um, and be productive people in society. So this is the route that we've taken that we feel is gonna work best. They're capable of responsibility and more um, student ownership of what happens in the school will actually bring us to our highest results. I believe kids can do and they will do if you give them the training and the opportunities, uh, just, like, just like teachers and adults. When I went to school when I was young, you know, a, a teacher, there wasn't really empowered students. They were, the teacher would just teach, stand in front of that class, talk for 40-something minutes, and, and that was it. The old-fashioned way didn't work. How many students were not passing the living environment? That first year would have to be, I would say, somewhere around 20. 20 didn't pass. 20 did not pass. So they took it and they failed it. They took it repeatedly because most of the students in the class weren't just one-time, you know, test takers. That would mean that they took it their sophomore year, probably twice, their junior year twice, and this was gonna be like the fifth time that they were gonna be taking the test. At the time, I was in the 11th grade, and Mr. Sim came up with this brilliant idea to break up the, the class into smaller groups that would focus on tasks that were um, basically what the kids needed the most help on. The first time around, we had eight students passed, so we reduced the number from 20 to 12, and after that six-month semester, we got all the seniors to pass. We realized that peer tutoring was definitely a, a main component into how the students succeeded. If anybody who would like to share what happened? The beginning actually started my second semester, ninth grade, was when the teachers see my knowledge in math and living environment and then they pulled me out and then had me tutoring instead of sitting in the class and learning because I knew the, the material. They had me teaching other students math and living environment. AVID stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination. AVID is a tutoring program. I got trained to be an AVID tutor by Mr. Lopez and he taught me tutorology. Students learned how to tutor a small group of students. There's about seven of them that tutor on a regular basis, and they tutor the AVID students. Tutorology is a different way to tutor. Tutorology was just helping us focus on how to teach each different type of student, either tactile, auditory, or visual. A lot of times, people forget about the middle students, the ones that aren't failing, but the ones who aren't excelling. We get that middle range, and we give them the attention that they need to succeed. Our biggest struggle was having tutors, but since we started student empowerment and these kids received, these students received tutorology, uh, this whole year we've had students in there tutoring twice a week, and that's made a dramatic difference. Uh, I think their, their grades have definitely improved. Um, it's just the collaboration between students. If you just were to visit the classroom, you would see uh, so much learning occurring uh, in, in the small groups because of all this extra review they're getting in tutorials. Study Jam is definitely a fun place to be. Study Jam is a tutoring session, but it's not really structure. It's students tutoring students. Because, look, students can come out and study in an informal setting. It's like, you know, you eat, you talk, you study. Our students leave these schools at the school at 3.37, and many of them don't even open up their, their book bags again 
uh, their notebooks until they come to class the next day. I think it's been a success because when you go from having nothing to having it, you know, to it occurring more consistently and kids are learning and talking about academics, it's always a success and it's only going to get better. The student empowerment team consists of about five at first, and it was just students who were already leaders in our school. Student empowerment for me at HSVD is having the students take ownership of their own learning, their own high school experience, and their own future. It gives them uh, stronger options to be successful in any arena, not just academics, uh, work environment, it shows them how to be collaborative, um, work as a team, uh, critically think, analyze data. We figured if we can find a way to have the kids become so independent and so self-assured and a high sense of self-esteem self and self-efficacy, we figured that will innately change our school culture to something that's even better. Based out of just talking and the positive experiences that were coming out, we had more teachers buy into the idea. And then before we knew it, we had students invite their families coming to retreats, doing overnight retreat weekends. We do a lot of retreats throughout the year. They were coming to our retreats. And soon the buy-in was almost like it was self-fulfilling. Um, it was rolling on its own. We started recruiting more students based on the criteria that we came up with during one of our student empowerment meetings. And our criteria was basically you have to have a certain percentage of attendance, grades, attitude towards teachers. And that's how we started recruiting more members for the student empowerment team. Once I came in my junior year and I saw these new opportunities, new programs to do, um, I felt like the I felt like the teachers and principals and students, um, that they were mostly encouraging students to be a part of the team. We have about, about 12, I want to say, uh, members on the team, including students. Students have a unique perspective on everything that happens in school because they're students. And it's easy to forget what a student has to deal with in terms of their um, thinking and learning when you're a teacher and you haven't been in that position for a while. The curriculum team is a committee that we've developed that uh, creates exams. They're called periodic assessments and they're given every six weeks and their role is to create exams, grade exams, and analyze the data from the exams and therefore after that give feedback to teachers. So that teachers can assess students throughout the school year to make sure they are learning what they need to learn to be successful in the classroom but also on the Regents exams. Just like you guys are here for the day, we did the same thing. The reason why we try to have um, visits to showcase the things that are happening in our school. Number one is to um, be able to get feedback from a different set of eyes, from a different school culture about what's happening in our community and how we can maybe expand on what we're doing and things that maybe we haven't thought about. The more opportunities that you have to showcase what's happening in your school, the better people feel about what they're doing. It gives them a sense of them going in the right direction. And it helps them rethink, reflect, and, and it actually motivates people to want to even get better. If you want to put pressure on people to achieve higher at higher lengths, then you got to set them up in situations um, where it's going to stretch them and challenge them and get them excited about thinking about doing something new and different. Like, what's the next visit going to be about? Um, when, when people come back, what are they going to see different next year? How are they going to see how we expand it? Whether you agree, disagree, you want to add something to it. The students on May 8th were impressive and they also made me feel really proud to work with them. All that week they spent their lunch times rehearsing with me and um, writing their notes down on index cards and practicing. They just kept their cool during their presentations and I remember afterwards hearing some of them say, oh that was easy, um, you know, it's hard to get in front of and up in front of a lot of people, especially adults, and so I was impressed by that also.
Professional development are um, meetings. This is where we use our information, what we learned, um, and how is it that we do it when we are all together. Basically, you share your strategic methods that you use in your classroom. It's bringing ideas so other teachers and other principals from different schools, they can also share that with their schools. Let them know how they did just by using Costa's level of questioning. We're doing PDs to principals from other schools and teachers and staff, so we really gotta increase our level of everything that we do, vocabulary, everything. It helps give them um, better public speaking skills. If they have the ability to really teach or give professional development to a group of people, it really shows us they, they really know what they're talking about because, you know, the highest level is when you teach somebody. We talk about curriculum team, we talk about RYG. RYG is red, yellow, green. How students mark it, if red they don't know it, yellow they're that kind of story to know it. And green is, they're good to go. I love RYG. I'd like to see your answer with your confidence at this time for question number 17. Okay, twos and fours are the majority with lots of yellows and two reds. It helps because when the students are approaching a question, whether I've used it on multiple choice questions in history class, and I've also used it on document-based questions, which are short answer, um, the students automatically have to think about how much they know about that question. Just by thinking about how much they know, they're automatically generating ideas, thinking back to class, thinking back to their notes, and being much more aware of what is being asked of them. And in the end, I think they actually perform better because they're forced to think more about the, their working knowledge. It's important to have students take part in professional development activities because you get to hear their perspective and um, they get to share what they're learning and that's empowering them and when they know they have something to share they'll take their work more seriously in the classroom. The project work that you're going to experience today um, is a testament to what we believe at HSBD. So without further ado, roundtables, let them begin. We did roundtables um, because we saw something downstairs in Max. Morris Academy for Collaborative Studies. Yeah. And we realized that we were, A, at a place to do something challenging for our school, and we needed to bring something back to the school for our students that would challenge them. And so he came up with the idea of having round tables and having the students um, create surveys and collect data based on those surveys and then make graphic representations of them. And I just thought it sounded like a lot of fun. They left the round tables, knowing how to create a budget sheet. They learn how to calculate and work with simple percents. They learn how to estimate based off of what they were spending. So they each had a budget to spend around $30, $40 per group and to turn that into a gain. They also learn how to work together. They learn how to present clearly and to refine their work. The presentations were excellent, and although the kids didn't want to do the projects at first, by the time we had finished our first round tables, they were ready to start another project, so I know they had a good time. Trying something different, trying something new, keeps you engaged in the work. It keeps you um, thinking. We need to have that kind of forward vision and thinking for our schools where the teachers are not the primary source of knowledge, that we design it so that students can become the primary source of knowledge. In order for this to be able to work anywhere else, you would need a high level of commitment from staff. You need much collaboration. You need forward thinkers. You need teachers who are going to allow students to have a voice. You need to be able to be willing to have students give up some of their time in the classroom in order to make student empowerment work. And eventually they won't need to give up that time. It takes everybody in the staff to be on the same page and to actually trust um, each other that we all have the students best intentions and needs in mind. Because we also want the best for other students. We don't only want it for us. If we know that something 
it's helping us why keep it to ourselves? We rather, you know, help other students so they can say, oh, look, we learned this from high school for violin and dance. What job, especially in a leadership position, um, are you effective without networking, finding resources, being able to collaborate with people? It's a strong model. Students learn better from students because they can talk each other's language a lot better. They have a better connection with them. I never had a voice in my, any of my schools till I got to HSVD. Now they know the students' vision of how class is going. So it makes a better learning environment and it creates relationships. Throughout my whole 12 years of schooling, I've gotten the best teachers in these past four years. We put a lot of focus on teacher development, but the truth of the matter is, um, we need the students to take ownership of their own learning, their own goals, their own dreams and being able to own them and showing them while they're in high school that they have a voice, they have power, and those things can actually happen. Student empowerment exponentially.